If you love our crypto content or are looking to learn even more about crypto, be sure to check out and subscribe to our new YouTube channel after this video dedicated to all things crypto. Find new videos every week. Be sure to check the link in the description. Good morning, everyone. This is exciting. I have no, no idea how many people are watching this, but I think it's a pretty big number. So um, excited to kick this off. We will get going here. My name is Travis Kling. I'm the founder and chief investment officer of Ikigai Asset Management. The two uh, fine folks that I'm going to be talking to today um, don't really need much introduction at all, uh, so we can uh, really jump right into it. The, the, these two individuals are uh, prolific analysts and commentators and uh, content providers in the macro space. Uh, founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, Lynn Alden, and founder and president of Forest for the Trees, Luke Grauman. Lynn and Luke, good morning. Good morning, Travis. Thanks for yeah, thanks for having us. Perfect. You, you guys sound good. Um, well, we got a lot to cover here, so we can go ahead and kick it off. So, so just to set the stage here, um, the purpose of this conversation is to uh, try and unpack the macro landscape, um, specifically Bitcoin in the context of the macro landscape. So, so to to maybe set the stage there, how would each of you grade the overall macro environment for Bitcoin as we sit here today in March of 2021? Yeah, I would start off by saying it's if on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being a very favorable environment and, and one being a poor environment, I would say we're probably at a nine plus right now. Yeah, there's so many factors involved. I and mean, we've had, you know, just the you know, the, the biggest economic shock we've seen, you know, in, in generations combined with the biggest policy response. And so that, you know, the narrative for Bitcoin couldn't be kind of more clear. You're comparing a finite asset to, you know, basically just essentially funny money. We basically have as many dollars as we need to make things work. And so that kind of comparison works really well. Uh, and just, you know, basically stimulus checks going out. People can, you know, there's a narrative of using them to buy Bitcoin for some people. Uh, and so when you, when you factor all the different forces together, it's a really good environment. Yeah, I agree with that. Although uh, rating it a nine implies that it can only go get 10 percent better than it is right now, uh, you know, which we don't have central banks, at least that we know of buying on balance sheet yet and, and a number of other things that. Uh, so, that, you know, I guess I would say it's really good. Um, but I think still, you know, has has some room to run. But but in terms of the monetary and fiscal policies in place to um, act as a forcing function into a, a a digital alternative store of value, yeah, it's yeah, it's quite good. Um, I think. It, yeah. yeah. Well, so, so so what are you guys' outlook for for inflation, um, and and how has that changed? Let's say since the election. Go ahead, Len. Uh, so I would say, you know, we have to watch out for base effects. Uh, and that's that's something I've been stressing is that, you know, when you compare inflation, it's usually year over year. Uh, and we had, you know, from, from the uh, pandemic shutdown, we had the biggest dip in inflation back in April and May of last year. And so when we get to April and May of this year, which are going to be reported uh, in, the, in the months following, uh, you know, May and June, uh, you're likely to get a uh, pretty big headline year over year numbers. Uh, you know, decent chance of of going over three percent, even with you know official headline CPI, uh, let alone let alone what other calculations may say. Uh, and so uh, that's going to be. Kind Hi, of I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. chance of, of going over three percent even with you know official headline CPI uh, let alone let alone what other calculations may say uh, and so uh, that's going to be kind of interesting impact to the bond market I mean on some to some extent they should be already anticipating that 
Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, things have a habit of not really moving until there's kind of a surprise out. Uh, and so overall, you know, we're, we're clearly in a reflationary response. And I think the biggest question is going to be how persistent is this? So it's like, is, are we going to get another stimulus package later this year? Or is that going to get held up in Congress? And so it's really going to largely depend on, on fiscal policies, uh, you know, more than, say, what the Federal Reserve does. Uh, but there are a couple bottlenecks uh, that, that the Fed basically, you know, has certain decision points around, whether it's controlling yields, whether it's having to buy more assets that, you know, maybe Luke will get into. Uh, and so there's a, a bunch of forces that could dictate as you go later into this year or into next year what inflation might do. Uh, but the near-term thing I'm really focusing on is is see how the market digests those those base effects. Yeah, for me, I look at it a little more from a from a um, from the structural side, and I, I think inflation. I, I agree with Lynn 100. percent I think it, there's going to be a heavily a political component to it, and and what I mean by that is that in the aftermath of COVID, there's any number of metrics that that we look at suggest that the U.S. fiscal situation has really become. Uh, irrecoverable. Uh, you look at the big three expenditures that the United States spends on, the US, U.S. government spends on entitlements, defense, interest expense, treasury spending. It's 145 percent of tax receipts. Just the true interest expense of the U.S. government, which is the treasury and interest spending combined with the pay-as-you-go portion of entitlements, which are really just the interest-like uh, portion of those ob obligations, those are running at about 108 percent of tax receipts. And so to me, uh, it is, I, I think, something that is really underappreciated by markets still uh, regarding and how it feeds back into inflation is, is I think we are going to see um, stimulus. Um, I, I think we get done with the trillion nine. We're already hearing about three trillion. I think after that three trillion, we're going to get another three trillion. I think after that, we'll get another three trillion. And I think they'll go through a series of excuses for what's causing it. First, it's COVID relief, because politically, who can be against that? And then it'll be, you know, build back better, because you know what? Who can be against building back better? And then it'll be a Green New Deal, because who can argue with the environment? And who, you know, then after that, maybe we'll get some more infrastructure, because who can argue with that? And to me, um, it speaks to, you know, Atlanta GDP right now is, the Fed now metric is reading 10% GDP. And, and I think consensus is that maybe, Maybe we'll have a quarter or two where GDP runs 8 to 10, and the 10-year yield is at 1.75%. I think we're going to run for years at 500 to 800 basis points, where nominal GDP is growing 500 to 800 basis points above the 10-year yield. And I think it will largely be stimulus-driven. Uh, to Lynn's point, uh, at any point in time, if that stimulus doesn't come, if there's a political held-up, if midterms, whatever, um, then I think that starts to be a concern in terms of our inflationary outlook. Well, one follow-on question for that. I, I guess it's you know, kind of hard to have our own view on inflation without reading what the Fed's view on inflation is. So just to put some more rankings around this, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how big of a green light was Jay Powell last week for risk assets broadly, in your opinion? Well, I think it depends on if you look at, at the parts they, they are controlling now versus what they're not controlling. And so uh, they gave a pretty gre big uh, green light in terms of the policy they're willing to do, which is that basically they're going to resist the market pricing in rate hikes before they get the inflation that they're looking for the way they measure it. Uh, and so he was pretty clear about that. He kind of reiterated the stance they've been saying. Uh, and so they made it clear that they're they're willing to let this run hot. And they're also they referenced the base effects that I talked about. So we already know the narrative that they're going to use later this spring. If we should get those those, you know, three uh, percent year over year CPI prints, they're going to point out the base effects. They're going to say it's transient and they're going to hold rates uh, low. Uh, the big question for, for risk assets more broadly uh, is the long end of the curve. So we, we've had some upward uh, pressure on the long end of the curve. It's cooled in the past week, though. Uh, but the structural kind of uh, you know trend since since August of last year is up, and it really accelerated earlier this year. Uh, and so uh, so far, the Fed has kind of played chicken with the long end of the curve, uh, and they've been less uh, willing to to talk it down to the extent that you know uh, uh, Europe has, or we haven't done explicit yield curve control like Australia yet. And so the Fed's uh, in some ways actually walking that that fine line, but being very clear about the the short end of the curve, extremely dovish about the the short end of the curve, and and continued asset purchases, uh, but then a little bit mixed when you get out to the 
you know, what they're willing to do for the long end of the curve. I think a lot of what the Fed's messaging these days is uh, what we've called trying to ride two horses with one rear end. And the two horses they're trying to ride are closing the output gap, getting GDP back, getting unemployment back to uh, the levels we were pre-COVID, and, and, and calming uh, markets while simultaneously not hurting the dollar. So they're basically trying to choose both the economy and the dollar. And I think the longer, so far they've done a very admirable job of being able to ride two horses with their one rear end. The problem is, is the further we get away from COVID, uh, given the fiscal situation, given the debt position post COVID, those horses are increasingly riding in different directions and they're going to have to choose. And I think later this year, probably within the next three to six months, they're going to have to make a much more explicit choice as to which horse they want to ride. Do they want to ride the economy horse or do they want to ride the dollar horse uh, because they can't ride mm. both for much longer? And I think it kind of speaks to what, what Lynn said as well in terms of just this messaging. So that's, that's how we're thinking about it. That, that's a perfect transition into the next question, which is, you know, over the last couple of weeks we've had Len, you just mentioned the acceleration in rates, um, and particularly on the long end, and at least for short bursts over the last few weeks, that did metastasize into, you know, these very short bouts of kind of risk off. Um, you had a bad seven-year Treasury auction in the back part of uh, uh, last month. Um, all of that seems to have calmed down. I mean, we're sitting here right now, the VIX is sub 20, uh, S and P is, you know, right off its all time highs, uh, crude has rolled over, you know, meaningfully, but, um, what in, how are you guys thinking about the likelihood that as we go forward through the rest of this year, that the kind of rate situation metastasizes further into some kind of broader, risk off environment across the board uh so partially uh i'm watching because if you look at the first half of this year uh it, in some ways there's not a ton of treasury issuance and that's because they're drawing down the treasury general account meaning that in 2020 they issued more bonds than the money they spent and so they the, you know the treasury basically collected this big cash pile it was 1.8 trillion dollars and uh in the first half of this year they plan to draw most of that back down uh closer to normal levels, which would be, you know, uh, potentially a, around a half a trillion. Uh, and so as that plays out, that means they don't have to issue as many treasuries as they might otherwise have had to uh, for some of these stimulus efforts. Uh, however, once that effect wears off, if you do get, you know, the, the, the next round of fiscal stimulus, that also come out from new treasury issuance. And so then we start to run into uh, the question of how much, uh, you know, the private sector and the foreign sector uh, can absorb in terms of treasuries. Uh, and so over the past uh, you know, uh, few years, we've not seen a lot of uh, foreign buying, and there's only so much capacity that the, that the domestic balance sheet can hold. And then with the SLR uh, you know, uh, rules back in place, banks can only hold uh, so many treasuries. And so we're going to basically see the Fed make some difficult decisions, uh, unless, of course, uh, we go back to that political gridlock question of that they don't pass another round of stimulus. Uh, it can basically then push those questions later for the Fed. But if you do get those uh, some of those bills that that the Biden administration is planning on doing, if they can if they can get those through a, a pretty narrowly divided Senate, uh, it, it starts opening interesting questions for the Treasury supply demand problem, given what the Fed uh, says they're they're willing to buy, and we're already kind of seeing that start to inch up. Yeah, I, I, would, I would echo that. I think the fundamental problem is is if you look back historically, when sovereign debt levels get to where they are, and actually well below where they are. Um, historically, over the last 40 years, it's only happened in emerging markets, but it's now actually the advanced economies are, are worse in aggregate than the emerging markets. Uh, historically, there's only three ways out of this problem over the last uh, century to, 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 to two centuries, which is you default to restructure the sovereign debt, uh, you inflate away or financially repress it away, or you hyperinflate. And if we can set aside restructuring default uh, as an option, because I think that's extraordinarily unlikely that the United States government will do that explicitly or nominally, then we're left with financial repression and inflation. So if, if I'm the Fed, I see uh, this, this mismatch of domestic uh, uh, or foreign, foreign demand for treasuries 
the coming supply, uh, the fiscal stimulus. Uh, they need to keep rates low while GDP grows rapidly to try to inflate their way out of this. So basically, they they need the bond market to be the frog in the pot while they turn up the water. And I think what we've seen uh, what we've seen is the water has started to get warm and. Uh, February and March, I think maybe the, the the frog started to notice that uh, that it's it's going from to, from from a from a jacuzzi to something hotter than a jacuzzi, uh, and so really, if I was the Fed, I, I think again, I think they're doing a, a decent job of managing a really untenable situation. If I was them, I would be effectively trying to sort of normalize rates, let the long end back up in a linear fashion. And uh, see see where something breaks, see where things start to uh, act weird. Now, the question for me is is what you know what is weird? What is something breaking? Uh, it's very possible that that poor seven year auction and that the, the punkish twenty year and thirty year that we saw ten ten uh, late February early March that might have been enough for them to see because what we have seen as yields have backed up has been the pace of Fed balance sheet growth. Has risen meaningfully. Uh, they grew the balance sheet 180 billion in in uh, February, 50 uh, percent above the stated target of 120 billion at least, uh, and they're running at a faster pace thus far uh, in March as well. So, I think it, it really it, it ties back to the point earlier where they're trying to ride two horses with one rear end. The horses are riding in different directions, and so to me. You get out three to six months, um, it, it, the situation really starts to look pretty. Um, it really starts to look like the Fed is going to have to upsize uh, its balance sheet growth, whether they do it explicitly or they just keep kind of doing it quietly and saying we're going to do at least 120 and then do 200, 300, whatever they have to do a month. Uh, that remains open for question. Mm -hmm. so, so could it be as simple as you do a little extra QE like you've been doing and I guess just try and sweep that underneath the rug because I feel like it's not something that people have been talking about. And then if you can get the, I guess, FX adjusted real yields to the point where there's a positive carry, then you start to bring in some of the, I guess, international sovereign buyers. Is that the way to kind of maybe think about triangulating those? I would say so. I think Ultimately, every tick that the dollar goes higher, all else equal, makes puts more pressure on the Fed to buy more. Uh, every tick the dollar goes lower uh, rem removes or, or gets you closer to re reintroducing uh, some foreign demand uh, or sufficient foreign demand, I probably should say. Uh, you saw that a little bit in the move from, uh, call it 98 to 89 in the DXY over the last 12 months to earlier this year. Uh, you started to see FX hedge treasury yields reach a point where you were getting some Japanese demand back into the market. Uh, Chinese demand may be on the margin a little bit. But but ultimately, I think that's probably the strategy the Fed does is just sort of flex the balance sheet up and down or uh, not down, but flex it up in terms of the pace relative to the target uh, of, of balance sheet growth, uh, because that they retain optionality in doing that. If they commit to the 200, now they're committed or to upsizing it to 180 every month like they did last month. Now they're committed. Um, if they commit to a yield cur uh, a yield rate or yield explicit yield curve control, then they're really committed. I think that's something they want to avoid at all costs. So I could see them trying to retain that optionality, do it quietly and just sort of manage the yield curve, manage the dollar, et cetera. Yeah, they give themselves a lot of flexibility by putting the words at least in there. And so their 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 mandate right now that they've given themselves is that they're going to buy uh, 80 billion uh, or at least of treasury issuance uh, you know per month and then at least 40 billion of mortgage backed securities and so that's where you get the 120 billion at least figure uh, and they have no upper cap uh, and so they just have to kind of then walk through uh, some of the narratives around what they're doing and so if they if they go longer or bigger than the market expects especially as you get deeper into recovery when the market would naturally uh, in a normal cycle be expecting a tapering uh, that's when the narrative gets pretty hard to do. Is it hasn't, you know, all the Fed actions have been easy to justify uh, during the first year of this of this pandemic recovery. Uh, but when we get into later part of this year, uh, if they're unable to taper, uh, that starts getting interesting. And we saw, you know, kind of a taste of this back in late 2019 when the Fed suddenly had to begin uh, doing QE, but they didn't want to call it QE. Uh, and so markets like whatever you want to call it, we're going to respond to it as though it's QE. Uh, and uh, basically, they, they couldn't they couldn't cleanly articulate 
why they were doing what they were doing. Uh, and, and, and so that caused the market to, you know, basically look at things and figure out, wait, that there are too many treasury bills compared to reserves in the system and kind of start uh, winding through that themselves because the Fed was unable to kind of clarify why they absolutely had to do this. Yeah, and, and, and Lynn, you've talked about this before. The, the, I mean, the Fed is in a position to be reactive, and they do need th need things to probably break at least a little bit uh, so that they can have the cover that they need to go do something. Uh, and we've seen that, to your point, a few different times. I mean, you know, friendly reminder, the Fed cut interest rates three times before anybody ever said coronavirus and started not QE, QE before anybody ever said coronavirus. And, and um, you know, I guess they're just going to have to wait for something, you know, minor to break again and then start to metastasize so that provides the cover that they need to go and do, you know, whatever monetary was going to happen anyways. Yeah, and it's you know part of the reason they couldn't talk about it in our view is is that the issue was it was a it was the a, a, a worsening U.S. fiscal crisis. The problem was they had too much you know too too much treasury issuance, too big a deficits, not enough demand uh, at the longer end. And if you looked at where they were financing a lot of what was they were issuing, I mean, I think in 2019, if just going off the top of my head. Gross Treasury issuance that year, uh, including rolls, I think was eleven or twelve trillion dollars, and seventy percent of that was done at six months or less. So the U.S. government has gone from financing itself at the long end with central banks to at the short end with levered hedge funds. And as the yield curve flattened, the, the levered hedge funds uh, had much less appetite to uh, uh, to to buy carry or to participate in that trade. And and then you ended up with just too many T bills, not enough reserves, and the Fed had to effectively uh, finance begin financing the government. Now, what's important, I think, in, in terms of that context, Travis, is post COVID, what was a quickly worsening uh, U.S. fiscal problem is now an acute. As we talked about before, just it's it blew a gaping hole. COVID blew a great gaping hole in in what were already rapidly worsening numbers. So those issues still exist, and that's sort of the elephant in the room, in, in my view, in terms of Fed policy. From a what they're going to have to do, and b how long they can let things break uh, before they have to step in. Which is to say, I don't think they can really let things get very crazy for very long before they've got to react. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, okay, um, broader question. <clears throat> In, anything surprising so far this year um, about you know kind of anything in macro, or, or maybe what you know what's the one or two things that have been the most surprising year to date? Uh, watching the speed of the bond market uh, kind of return uh, to uh, you know where it's trying to be, I think was interesting uh, because we had a very slow march up uh, through much of 2020, and so it, it started to get somewhat disorderly pretty quickly. <laughs> Uh, so that was a little bit faster than, say, my base case would have would have anticipated. Although it does make sense because you know real yields naturally want to turn to positive territory where possible. I mean, Treasuries don't want to spend their time uh, below the inflation rate uh, for very long. Once they're convinced that deflation is not going to happen, they want to push back up and they want to get back into positive real territory. Uh, and so we, we've seen basically kind of a, a quicker um, just realization. I think that that some of this stimulus is likely to persist for a while, uh, and so that's not so far. It's not a ton surprising. It's just kind of you know, I've kind of laid out starting late last year that we're in indecisive period. Like uh, I was a dollar bear from from you know October 2019, uh, you know throughout 2020, uh, but then when we started getting later into the year, we saw the positioning that was pretty bearish in the dollar. I started to say I'm actually kind of you know unclear for the next three to six months because. So in some ways, we got the easy moves out of the way, right? So we, we got the, the, the big deflationary shock happened. Then we got the huge policy response. You could buy all the things that, you know, underperformed, and then they, they would go up like a rocket. And once we kind of got a lot of things back, uh, you know, towards the range of being where they were pre-pandemic, that's when the it gets a lot harder, and you're starting to face kind of market chop. You're starting to face kind of sector rotations and fake rotations. Uh, and so in some ways, this is the, the harder environment to navigate than the 2020 environment. Yeah, I would say uh, I would say the fact that the dollar didn't bounce more than it did uh, when it went from call it I guess what 89 to, to 92, and it's sort of back 92. We'll see if what happens from here. 
Uh, but it just seemed like some of the, like 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 uh, Lynn said, some of the sentiment had got very bearish, some of the positioning got very bearish. You had some set setups in terms of it was looking like the Fed uh, was going to start not buying enough treasuries effectively, as opposed to last year buying more than enough uh, relative to issuance. So I was surprised it hadn't, it didn't bounce harder than it has. And I guess the second thing that that sort of surprised me was uh, in the whole GameStop situation, how quickly that affected the broader indices in a big way, and how quickly the policymakers. Uh, were drawn into uh, commenting or acting on that because I, I remember, you know, short squeezing. I think it was Volkswagen. I don't know, eight or nine years ago, maybe ten years ago. It was similar in magnitude. Obviously, Volkswagen's a pretty big company. There were sort of no systemic impacts whatsoever. And here, uh, boy, you get GameStop up a bunch for five or eight trading days, and all of a sudden, you're having major sell-offs in, in markets. And, and to me, it was really indicative of the amount of leverage that's just endemic in the system. And, it, and I think it spoke to um, it, 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 it supported my viewpoint that I that I held going into that episode of that the, the leverage is so great. The situation is so dire that policymakers aren't going to have quarters or months even to respond when something starts to go wrong, even uh a bankrupt video game retailer getting short squeezed, they're going to have to act pretty quickly, which I think is is, is important to take note of. I, I completely agree with that. It, it's it's indicative of how rickety this system has gotten overall. Yeah, at, at the peak of the GameStop stress, VIX was up 62% in a day at the peak of that. And I was sitting there you know, watching all of this unfold, talking to other macro guys that I, I'm in active discussions with, you know, and I, you're basically looking at this and you're going, if this continues for, I don't know, three more days or something like that, the Fed is going to have to step in because of a Reddit user named Deep Fucking Value. And that's just an incredible, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, welcome to 2021, I guess. So, um, uh, uh, Okay, and okay, so uh, I think continuing on from that, uh, just had a headline a couple days ago about Jay Powell comparing Bitcoin uh, more like gold than like the dollar, um, widening that out a little bit. What do we think the Fed slash Treasury actually thinks about Bitcoin? We we know they're in the business of saying things that are not what they actually mean or what they actually think. But so what do we what do we think they actually think about Bitcoin? So I think it's shifted over time. And one one thing I, I try to do, I think they're starting to think exponentially. I think that that that's changing a little bit. And so before you could dismiss it because it was a small asset class. Uh, and even now, even at a trillion dollar asset class, uh, you know, for Bitcoin, uh, when you look at how that compares to, say, U.S. household net worth, which is well over a hundred trillion, it's still a small percentage. And and so, for example, the vast majority of people, you know, they hold a lot of their money outside of, say, cash. They don't hold it in the bank. They hold it in real estate. They hold it in stocks. Uh, they hold it in all sorts of things. And so, it is natural to have these various stores of value uh, that the that the Fed's not worried about. Uh, now. There are certain ones that are kind of, you know, uh, that they prefer people put in uh, more, like real estate and stocks, rather than something like gold and Bitcoin. But as long as gold and Bitcoin are a small percentage of that total pie, uh, they're not they're not super concerned. But I think what woke them up is the the exponential nature of Bitcoin and saying, okay, what if this adds another zero to it? What does that start to look like? And I think th they're starting to become a little bit more aware of those situations. Mm. And naturally, they won't. They won't explicitly compare it to the dollar. They they prefer to you know they they like the the narrative of, of it being purely a speculative asset, uh, rather than really kind of focusing on some of the development that's happening around Lightning or around some of these other things that you know potentially make it more and more uh, of something for them to watch. Yeah, I, I think I, I think it's gone from a curiosity to them to something more than that, and I think they're starting to be. I think they're more concerned, maybe than they're letting on. Be for two reasons. I think number one, uh, because of the centralization of gold, they were able, they've been able to control the price of gold. They they can control gold by virtue of allowing the um, uh, ex un, uh, the expansion, the unregulated expansion of unallocated paper gold derivatives centered in London. And so 
uh, they can they can expand their balance sheet, they can print a bunch of money, and they can say there's not that much inflation and gold is not going to act as a as a, a proper smoke alarm or fire alarm to what they're doing. Uh, because they can just let the the expansion of paper gold uh, keep pace with the expansion of paper dollars. Problem solved. Bitcoin, given its decentralized nature, fixed supply, etc. Uh, to me, what Bitcoin's been doing is is less been a bubble of a speculative asset and more the last functioning smoke alarm. And it in the last you know the IMF. If you go back at it, the traditional IMF definition of hyperinflation is 50 percent per month. Uh, inflation. And if you go back to October of this year, to Lynn's point, uh, I think right now with where Bitcoin is, it's grown at about 42% per month. And for a yep. stretch a couple months ago, it was at 50% per month. So the dollar for a three-month stretch hyperinflated against Bitcoin. Will it continue? Mm. Will it not? I'm not sure. Now, I think they would love to be able to regulate it. I think they'd love to be able to institute derivatives. I think some element of the futures launches in 18 may have been uh, uh, attempting to address some of that. It obviously failed. The other challenge, though, in there, in in there, uh, that makes them uncomfortable, though, I think, is that the United States dollar as reserve currency just can't start slapping up capital controls on things just because they don't like the price on it. You, you there's, you, maybe they could get away with it. Uh, and by capital controls, if you control the on and off ramp for Bitcoin, that's a capital control. Um, and so, you know, could they get away with it with Bitcoin? Maybe, uh, but maybe not. You don't know, you know, it's one of those things where you don't know when you've gone too far. It, to me, it's very possible that if the U.S. did something very draconian toward, um, toward Bitcoin, that the dollar would actually suffer. You would actually see accelerating outflows uh, away from dollars elsewhere because people would start to say, okay, this is not the America we knew for the last 40 years. They are concerned about capital outflows. They are acting not as the reserve currency manager. So I think the tre Fed and Treasury feel a little bit trapped, particularly as Bitcoin gets bigger and bigger, as, as Lynn noted. I think, yeah, I think let's, also, let, you know, let, let, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say one of the interesting uh, narratives is the idea that as Bitcoin gets bigger, uh, you know, they're more threatened by it. Uh, but the other way around, the bigger Bitcoin gets, the harder it is for them to do things about it, uh, other than regulate it around the margins. And so, you know, when, when uh, you know, Fidelity is involved in it, when Morgan Stanley is involved in it, when you have, say, multiple custodians, uh, you have a lot of institutional buy-in, as we saw, you know, 2020 was the year of institutional uh, waking up to it. Uh, that kind of changes it, you know, compared to purely being, a, you know, mostly a retail product uh, in the years prior. And so it's kind of like, you know, by the time it got big enough where it's an issue, it's also big enough that it's increasingly uh, challenging for them to, you know, do some of those more draconian measures other than, uh, you know, try to KYC it where they can uh, and things like that. Yeah, yeah, let's unpack that a little bit more. So one way to frame this, again, back to rankings, um, on a scale of zero to 100, with zero being uh, the U.S. government is imminently going to make Bitcoin illegal to use or tax it into oblivion, and 100 being Bitcoin is completely safe from any sort of adversarial regulatory or tax uh, uh, legislation, where, where on the scale do you think Bitcoin's moved in the last year? Where was it a year ago? Where is it right now? So if one is no, you said one's no regulation, 100 is lots of regulation? No, zero is not safe at all. Okay. Sort of like imminently making it illegal. 100 is completely safe from gotcha. any adverse I, regulatory stuff. Yeah, I would say it's gone down in the last year. I would say it's I don't know if it was, you know, if it was, uh, you know, uh, if it was really safe a year ago because it was just so small. I think it's gotten on the radar screens more. You know, again, the challenge is, is what are they going to do in a world where game, a GameStop short squeeze for six days can can cause problems? Uh, if you do something too draconian to what is a now a trillion two in equity capital, effectively, uh, you're going to touch off a crisis because you you if you close the you, you they could the, tomorrow morning they could wake up and say we're going to make Bitcoin a boat that can never enter a port, right? We're going to close the on and off ramps. You cannot sell Bitcoin and move those dollars into the SWIFT system. Well, I'm going to start selling other assets to get liquid uh, because I was assuming some portion of my liquidity was and, and I'm going to have a trillion other friends, a trillion other dollars doing the same. And, you know, if GameStop did what it did, 
you got to believe taking a trillion in equity capital out of the system uh, overnight like that would be orders of magnitude worse. So I just, I do think it's gotten uh, a, a little bit more risk of regulation, but I think the uh, the regulations, I think, to Lynn's point, are going to be more uh, around the edges, KYC, AML, you know, maybe some of the offshore stuff, there's a risk in terms of some of the highly levered offshore exchanges and the ability, but I don't, I don't know that U.S. citizens are allowed to participate in that anyway, right? So um, I do think it's a little bit more risk, but I don't, I just don't know what, what that means in terms of practical ability to regulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once you have major central banks involved, I mean, uh, major investment banks involved, once you have the Black Rocks, the Fidelities of the world, uh, you know, in some ways, like, you know, to Luke's point, it's on their radar more, which which increases risk. Uh, but then it's also, you know, a much, uh, much bigger beast to deal with. And, uh, you know, as Bitcoin has gone large enough, now it has its own lobby, right? So there, there's basically uh, now an entrenched, uh, you know, it's it's not purely the, the new kid on the block anymore. Now it's it's got 12 years of history. It has some some powerful money in it, and so it has its own uh, political lobby. It has its own you know senator uh, with laser eyes uh, that day, uh, and so you know we have a couple uh, things that are a lot different now compared to several years ago. And so overall, uh, you know, and and most of the regulatory events that have happened have been about clarifications and if anything allowing certain things like kind of clarifying their stance on stable coins. Uh, you know, uh, allowing, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically moving forward with different custody solutions uh, for Bitcoin. And so, you know, most of their efforts are about clarification and even kind of trying to wrap around it, kind of pull it, you know, into the embrace of, of kind of the institutional world, which they view as a, as a method of, of controlling parts of it, uh, rather than, you know, doing the more draconian measures like that India's, uh, you know, kind of, you know, uh, dabbling with of trying to outright right. ban it. And, and, and to Luke's point, you know, the, a major capital market reserve currency has a much harder time, you know, outright banning assets uh, than, you know, a given emerging market. Yeah, I would I, I would agree with Lynn in, in that, you know, I think the, I, I think of it as like a buffer, you know, the uh, uh, decisions get made in America by and you can hate this or you can love it, but decisions get made in America by people that have wealth and power. And to the extent that folks with wealth and power are also Bitcoiners, then that serves as a, as a buffer, I think, against adverse regulatory uh, or, 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 or tax type of legislation. So when you have the mass mutuals, when you have the New York Lifes, when you have Morgan Stanley, when you have BNY Mellon, when you have the Stanley Druckenmillers and, and all, all these types of folks, um, you know, our government is made up of, of individuals that have personal networks and career histories and, you know, allegiances and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, I, I would, you know, it, it, yeah, yeah, in some ways it's, it's more on their radar, um, cause it's gotten so much bigger, but then at the same time, it's like better protected. I, I agree. And I, you raise a good point on that, Travis, and something we've, we've raised, uh, with our clients, which is, Historically, on the regulation side, we only hear from the banking lobby side of things to the way this threatens the dollar status quo and, and that side of Washington. But there's another side of Bitcoin where uh, that I think you need to think about and uh, in terms of the regulation, which is there's a side of Washington, there's a side of the government, particularly centered in the defense and intelligence establishment, that acutely realizes that the dollar is being weaponized by China against the U.S., uh, and so there is an element within the U.S. establishment that does not get nearly the airtime around Bitcoin um, that the sort of, you know, nothing can challenge the dollar hegemony uh, uh, airtime. But the realization that dollar hegemony is actually being weaponized against the United States and that if Bitcoin continues to grow, that is an effective countermeasure against that. Um, I think that that is a... Um, I think it's a very underappreciated point. And, you know, these are the types of folks that are not going to be on, you know, Bloomberg and CNBC sort of, you know, cheering it on day to day. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. I think there's a very real and very quiet and very powerful element within the United States, again, centered in defense and intelligence, uh, certain defense and intelligence circles uh, that realize that some sort of new reserve asset uh, could really help. Uh, and be good for the United States in this great power competition against China. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. Okay, we got uh, not very long left, so we'll wrap it up with um, final question. 
Is it your base case that Bitcoin is going to do a cyclical blow off top uh, as it has in previous uh, cycles? It, it, yes or no, is that your base case and is it high confidence or low confidence? Uh, yes, so it's I, my I'm base case. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was gonna be real quick. I was gonna say, yes, it's, yes, it's my base case and um, pretty high confidence. So my, my, my approach is, you know, overall, a lot of the on-chain indicators still look healthy. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is that we're, see we're still seeing coins leave exchanges. Uh, and so my overall view is that I, I do still think this cycle is going to have, uh, you know, kind of a, a really bullish spike and then, and then somewhat of a longer consolidation than we've seen. Uh, you know, but it, it's, it's somewhat muted by the fact that institutional investors can, are prone to rebalancing are prone to you know different types of money management than than some of the the, the leverage retail crowd, and so overall, I I, I I my base case is to follow it kind of similar to how it's gone through previous cycles, but you know with a, a less a less volatile band. Uh, but for me, it's a somewhat low conviction uh, because it, it is doing certain things that it hasn't done before, and so I, I think it's important to remain an open mind rather than assuming it has to kind of meet certain targets by certain months and then it's due for certain things after that. And I think we have to kind of keep, you know, looking at it, you know, see what's happening, seeing what's happening with the space over time. Yes, it's difficult to imagine if 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 central banks and governments globally are still going full gong show with monetary and fiscal policies, that this thing can really pull back all that much because the institutional bid for Bitcoin is here essentially unanimously for the same reason, which is as a hedge against that. And uh, if that train's still running down the tracks, I don't know how you scare off that institutional bid. So uh, we're up against time, so we can leave it there for now. Um, Lynn and Luke really enjoyed it. I thought that was a great discussion. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, me too. Nice to see you all. Great yep. seeing you guys. Great. Take care, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.